Chapter 11 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 11 Men of Science. My choice of men of science, like that of the men of literature, may seem capricious. They were both governed to some extent by similar considerations, and therefore the preface to my last chapter is a great degree applicable to this. There is yet another special difficulty in the selection of a satisfactory first class of scientific men. The fact of a person's name being associated with some one striking scientific discovery helps enormously, but often unduly, to prolong his reputation to after ages. It is notorious that the same discovery is frequently made simultaneously and quite independently by different persons, thus to speak of only a few cases in late years the discoveries of photography, of electric telegraphy, and of the planet Neptune, through theoretical calculations, have all their rival claimants. It would seem that discoveries are usually made when the time is ripe for them, that is to say when the ideas from which they naturally flow are fermenting in the minds of many men. When apples are ripe, a trifling event suffices to decide which of them shall first drop off its stalk, so a small accident will often determine the scientific man who shall first make and publish a new discovery. There are many persons who have contributed vast numbers of original memoirs, all of them of some, many of great, but none of extraordinary importance. These men have the capacity of making a striking discovery, though they had not the luck to do so. Their work is valuable and remains, but the worker is forgotten. Nay, some eminently scientific men have shown their original powers by little more than a continuous flow of helpful suggestions and criticisms which were individually of too little importance to be remembered in the history of science, but which, in the aggregate, formed a notable aid towards its progress. In the scanty history of the once well-known Lunar Society of the Midland Countries, of which Watt, Belton, and Darwin with the chief notabilities, there is frequent allusion to a man of whom nothing more than the name now remains, but who had apparently very great influence on the thoughts of his contemporaries. I mean Dr. Small, or to take a more recent case, I suppose that Dr. Wewell would be generally ranked in the class up against G of natural ability. His intellectual energy was prodigious, his writings unceasing, and his conversational powers extraordinary. Also, few will doubt that although the range of his labours was exceedingly wide and scattered, science in one form or another was his chief pursuit. His influence on the progress of science during the earlier years of his life was, I believe, considerable, but it is impossible to specify the particulars of that influence, or so to justify our opinion that posterity will be likely to pay regard to it. Biographers will seek in vain for important discoveries in science, with which Dr. Webel's name may hereafter be identified. Owing to these considerations, the area of my choice is greatly narrowed. I can only include those scientific men who have achieved an enduring reputation, or who are otherwise well known to the present generation. I have proceeded in my selection just as I did in the case of the literary men, namely, I have taken the most prominent names from ordinary biographical dictionaries. I now annex my usual tables. Table 1 is displayed on the page. Summary of relationships of 65 scientific men grouped into 43 families. One relation or two in family, two or three relations, or three or four in family, and four or more relations or five or more in family. And table two is also displayed on page with degrees of kinship, the name of degree, and corresponding letter. Table one confirms all that has been already deduced from the corresponding tables in other groups, but the figures in table two are exceptional. We find a remarkable diminution in the numbers of uppercase F and uppercase G, while uppercase S and uppercase P hold their own. We also find that although the female influence, on the whole, is but little different from previous groups, inasmuch as in the first degree. 1. Uppercase G plus 5 uppercase U plus 8 uppercase N plus 6 uppercase P equals 20 kinsmen through males. 5 lowercase g plus 2 lower u plus 2 lower n plus 0 lower p equals 9 females and in the second degree 0 uppercase gf plus 0 uppercase gb plus 3 uppercase us plus 6 uppercase ns plus 
three uppercase p s equals twelve kinsmen through males zero lower g upper f plus zero lower g upper b plus four lower u upper s plus zero lower n upper s plus zero lower p upper s equals four females totals thirty two through males thirteen through females yet when we examine the lists of kinsmen more closely we shall arrive at different conclusions and and we shall find the maternal influence to be unusually strong there are five lower g to one upper g and in fully eight cases out of the forty three the mother was the abler of the two parents these are the mothers of bacon remember also his four maternal aunts of buffton condocret curvier de Allenbert, forbes gregory and watt both Bertie and jesu had remarkable grandmothers the eminent relations of newton were connected with him by female links it therefore appears to be very important to success in science that a man should have an able mother i believe the reason to be that a child so circumstanced has the good fortune to be delivered from an ordinary narrowing by decent influences of home education our race is essentially slavish it is the nature of all of us to believe blindly in what we love rather than in what we think most wise we are inclined to look upon an honest unshrinking pursuit of truth as something irreverent we are indignant when others pry into our idols and criticize them with impunity just as a savage flies to arms when a missionary picks his fetish to pieces women are far more strongly influenced by these feelings than men they are blinder partisans and more servile followers of custom happy are they whose mothers did not intensify their naturally slavish dispositions in childhood by the frequent use of phrases such as do not ask questions about this or that for it is wrong to doubt but who showed them by practice and teaching that inquiry may be absolutely free without being irreverent that reverence for truth is the parent of free inquiry and that indifference or insincerity in that search after truth is one of the most degrading of sins it is clear that a child brought up under the influences i have described is far more likely to succeed as a scientific man the one who was reared under the curb of dogmatic authority of two men with equal abilities the one who had a truth-loving mother would be more likely to follow the career of science while the other if bred up under extremely narrowing circumstances would become as the gifted children in china nothing better than a student and a professor of some dead literature it is i believe owing to the favourable conditions of their early training that an unusually large proportion of the sons of the most gifted men of science become distinguished in the same career they have been nurtured in an atmosphere of free inquiry and observing as they grow older that myriads of problems lie on every side of them simply waiting for some moderately capable person to take the trouble of engaging in a solution they throw themselves with ardour into a field of labour so peculiarly tempting it is and has been in truth strangely neglected there are hundreds of students of books for one student of nature hundreds of commentators for one original inquirer the field of real science is in sore want of labourers the mass of mankind plods on with eyes fixed on the footsteps of the generations that went before too indifferent or too fearful to raise their glances to judge for themselves whether the path on which they are travelling is the best or to learn the conditions by which they are surrounded and affected hence as regards the eminent sons of the scientific men twenty-six in number there are only four whose eminence was not achieved in science these are the two political sons of arago himself a politician the son of haller and the son of napier as i said before the fathers of the ablest men in science have frequently been unscientific those of cassini and gamelin were scientific men so in a less degree than those of the huens napier and de Saussure but the remainder namely those of bacon boyle de candolle galilei and leibnitz were either statesmen or literary men as regards mathematicians when we consider how many among them have been possessed of enormous natural gifts it might have been expected that the lists of their eminent kinsmen would have been yet richer than they are there are several mathematicians in my appendix especially of the bernoulli family but the names of pascal laplace gorse and others of class upper g or even upper x 
are absent we might similarly have expected that the senior wranglers of cambridge would afford many noteworthy instances of hereditary ability shown in various careers but speaking generally this does not seem to be the case i know of several instances where the senior wrangler being eminently a man of mathematical genius as sir william thompson and mr archibald smith is related to other mathematicians or men of science but i know a few senior wranglers whose kinsmen have been eminent in other ways among the exceptions are sir john lefevre whose brother is the ex-baker viscount eversley and whose son is the present vice-president of the board of trade and sir f pollock the ex-chief baron whose kinships are described in judges i account for the rarity of such relationships in the following manner a man given to abstract ideas is not likely to succeed in the world unless he be particularly eminent in his particular line of intellectual effort if the more moderately gifted relative of a great mathematician can discover laws well and good but if he spends his days in puzzling over problems too insignificant to be of practical or theoretical import or else too hard for him to solve or if he simply reads what other people have written he makes no way at all and leaves no name behind him there are far fewer of numerous intermediate stages between eminence and mediocrity adopted for the occupation of men who are devoted to pure abstractions than for them whose interests are of a social kind End of chapter 11chapter twelve of hereditary genius by francis galton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by leon harvey chapter twelve poets the poets and artists generally are men of high aspirations but for all that they are a sensuous erotic race exceedingly irregular in their way of life even the stern and virtue-preaching dante is spoken of by boccaccio in most severe terms their talents are usually displayed early in youth when they are first shaken by the tempestuous passion of love of all who have a place in the appendix to this chapter cowper is the only one who began to write in mature life and none of the others who were named in the heading to my appendix except possibly camions and spencer displayed authorship till after thirty it may be interesting and it is instructive to state a few facts and evidence of their early powers beringer a printer's compositor taught himself and began to publish at sixteen burns was a village celebrity at sixteen and soon after began to write calderon at fourteen campbell's pleasures of hope was published when he was twenty gildoni produced a comedy in manuscript that amazed all who saw it at eight ben jonson a bricklayer's lad fairly worked his way upwards through westminster and cambridge and became famous by his every man and his humour at twenty-four keats a surgeon's apprentice first published at twenty-one and died at twenty-five metastasio improvised in public when a child and wrote at fifteen tom moore published under the name of thomas little and was famous at twenty-three ovid wrote verses from boyhood pope published his pastorals at sixteen and translated the iliad between twenty-five and thirty shakespeare must have begun very early for he had written almost all his historical plays by the time he was thirty-four schiller a boy of promise began famous through his brigands at twenty-three sophocles at the age of twenty-seven beat aeschylus at the public games i now annex the usual tables Table 1 is displayed on the page, summary of relationships of 24 poets grouped in 20 families. There are three groups, one relation or two in family, two or three relations or three or four in family, and four or more relations or five or more in family. Table 2 is also displayed on the page with degrees of kinship, with columns of the name of the degree and the corresponding letters. The results of Table 2 are surprising. It appears that if we accept the kindred of Coleridge and Wordsworth, who have shown various kinds of ability, almost all the relations are in the first degree. Poets are clearly not founders of families. The reason is, I think, simple, and it applies to artists generally. To be a great artist requires a rare, and so to speak, a natural correlation of qualities. A poet, besides his genius, must have the severity and steadfast earnestness of those whose dispositions afford few temptations to pleasure and he must at the same time have the utmost delight in the exercise of his senses and affections this is a rare character only to be formed by some happy accident and is therefore unstable in inheritance 
Usually, people who have strong sensuous tastes go utterly astray and fail in life, and this tendency is clearly shown by numerous instances mentioned in the following appendix, who have inherited the dangerous part of a poet's character, and not his other qualities that redeem and control it. End of chapter 12 to the Hereditary Genius Chapter 13 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 13. Musicians. The general remarks I made in the last chapter on artists apply with a special force to musicians. The irregularity of their lives is commonly extreme. The union of a painstaking disposition with the temperament requisite for a good musician is as rare as in poets, and the distractions incident to the public life of a great performer are vastly greater. Hence, although the fact of the inheritance of musical taste is notorious and undeniable, I find it exceedingly difficult to discuss its distribution among families. I also found it impossible to obtain a list of first-class musicians that commanded general approval of a length suitable to my purposes. There is an extensive jealousy in the musical world, fostered no doubt by the dependence of musicians upon public caprice for their professional advancement. Consequently, each school disparages others, individuals do the same, and most biographers are unusually adultery of their heroes, and unjust to those with whom they compare them. There exists no firmly established public opinion on the merits of musicians, similar to that which exists in regard to poets and painters and it is even difficult to find private persons of fair musical tastes who are qualified to give a deliberate and dispassionate selection of the most eminent musicians. As I have mentioned at the head of the appendix to this chapter, I was indebted to a literary and artistic friend in whose judgment I have confidence for the selection upon which I worked. The precocity of great musicians is extraordinary. There is no career in which eminence is achieved so early in life as in that of music. I now proceed to give the usual tables. Table 1 is displayed on the page. Summary of relationships of 26 musicians grouped into 14 families. One relation or two in family. Two or three relations or three or four in family. Four or more relations or five or more in family. Table 2 is also displayed with 14 families. In the first degree, second degree, third degree, or more remote. The nearness of degree of the eminent kinsmen is just as remarkable as it was in the case of the poets, and equally so in the absence of eminent relations through the female lines. Mendelssohn and Meyerbeer are the only musicians in my list whose eminent kinsmen have achieved their success in other careers than that of music. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14. Painters. Among painters, as among musicians, I think no one doubts that artistic talent is in some degree hereditary. The question is rather whether its distribution in families together with the adjuncts necessary to form an eminent painter follow much the same law as that which obtains in respect to other kinds of ability. It would be easy to collect a large number of modern names to show how frequently artistic eminence is shown by kinsmen. Thus the present generation of the Landseers consist of two academicans and one associate of the Royal Academy, who were all of them the sons of an associate. The Bonaire family consists of four painters, Rosa, Juliet, Jules, and Auguste, and they are the children of an artist of some merit. Very many more instances could easily be quoted, but I wish to adduce evidence of the interrelationship of artists of a yet higher order of merit, and I therefore limit my inquiry to the illustrious ancient painters, especially of Italy and the Low Countries. These are not numerous, only, as well as I can make out, about forty-two whose natural gifts are unquestionably more than eminent, and the fact of about half of them possessing eminent relations, and of some of them, as the Karaki and the Van Eyck's, being actually kinsmen is more important to my argument than pages filled with relationships of men of the classes upper f or upper e of artistic gifts it would be interesting to know the number of art students in europe during the last three or more centuries from whom the forty-two names i have selected are the most illustrious it is assuredly very great but it hardly deserves much pains in investigation because it would afford a minimum 
not a true indication of the artistic superiority of the 42 over the rest of the world. The reasons being that the art students are themselves a selected class. Lads follow painting as a profession, usually because they are instinctively drawn to it, and not as a career in which they were placed by accidental circumstances. I should estimate the average of the 42 painters to rank far above the average of class upper F in the natural gifts necessary for high success in art. In the following table, I have included 10 individuals that do not find a place in the list of 42, namely Isaac Ostade, Jacopo, and Gentile Bellini, Badil, Agostino, Caracci, William Miris, David Teniers, W. van der Velde, the Elder, and Francisco de Ponte, both the Elder and the Younger. The average rank of these men is far above that of the modern academician, though I have not ventured to include them in the most illustrious class. I have kept Claude in the latter, notwithstanding recent strictures, on account of his previously long-established reputation. Table 1 is displayed on the page. Summary of relationships of 26 painters grouped into 14 families. 1 a relation or 2 in family, 2 or 3 relations or 3 or 4 in family, 4 or more relations or 5 or more in family. Table 2 is displayed on the page. 14 families. 1st degree, 2nd degree, 3rd degree or more remote. The rareness with which artistic eminence passes through more than 2 degrees of kinship is almost as noticeable here as in the case of musicians and poets. End of chapter 14「Fifteen of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 15. Divines. I am now to push my statistical survey into regions where precise inquiries seldom penetrate and are not very generally welcomed. There is, commonly, so much vagueness of expression on the part of religious writers that I am unable to determine what they really mean when they speak of topics that directly bear on my present inquiry. I cannot guess how far their expressions are intended to be understood metaphorically, or in some other way to be clothed with a different meaning to what is imposed by the grammatical rules and plain meaning of language. The expressions to which I refer are those which assert the fertility of marriages and the establishment of families to be largely dependent upon godliness. I may even take a much wider range and include those other expressions which assert that material well-being generally is influenced by the same cause. I do not propose to occupy myself with criticising the interpretation of these or similar passages, or by endeavouring to show how they may be made to accord with fact. It is the business of theologians to do these things. What is simply to investigate whether or no the assertions they contain, according to their prima facie interpretation, are or are not in accordance with statistical deductions. If an exceptional providence protects the families of godly men, it is the fact that we must take into account natural gifts would then have to be conceived as due, in a high and probably measurable degree, to ancestral beauty, and, in a much lower degree than I might otherwise have been inclined to suppose, to ancestral natural peculiarities. All of us are familiar with another and exactly opposite opinion. It is popularly said that the children of religious parents frequently turn out badly, and numerous instances are quoted to support this assertion. If a wider induction and a careful analysis should prove the correctness of this view, it might appear to strongly oppose the theory of hereditary. On both these accounts, it is absolutely necessary to the just treatment of my subject to inquire into the history of religious people and learn the extent of their hereditary peculiarities and whether or no their lives are attended by an exceptionally good fortune. I have taken considerable pains to procure a suitable selection of divines for my inquiries. The Roman Catholic Church is rich in ecclesiastical biography, but affords no data for my statistics, for the obvious reason that its holy personages of both sexes are celibates, and therefore incapable of founding families. A collection of the bishops of our church would also be unsuitable, because during many generations they were principally remarkable as administrators, scholars, polemical writers, or courtiers, whence it would not be right to conclude, from the fact of their having been elevated to the bench, that they were men of extraordinary piety. I thought of many other selections of divines, which further consideration compelled me to abandon. At length I was fortunately directed to one that proved perfectly appropriate to my wants. Middleton's Biographica Evangelica, four volumes, eight fold, 1786, is exactly the kind of work that suits my inquiries. 
The biographies contained in it are not too numerous, for there are only 190 together, extending from the Reformation to the date of publication. Speaking more precisely, the collection includes the lives of 196 evangelical worthies taken from the whole of Europe, who, with the exception of the first four, namely Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome of Prague, and John of Wessalia, died between 1527 and 1785. This leaves 192 men during a period of 258 years, or three men in every four, a sufficiently rigorous but not too rigorous selection for my purposes. The biographies are written in excellent English, with well-weighed epithets, and though the collection is to some extent a compilation of other men's writings, it may justly be viewed as an integral work, in which a proportionate prominence has been given to the lives of the more important men, and not as a combination of separate memoirs, written without reference to one another. Middleton assures the reader, in his preface, that no bigoted partiality to sex will be found in his collection, that his whole attention has been paid to truly great and rigorous characters of all those persuasions which hold the distinguishing principle of the gospel. He does not define what, in his opinion, those principles are, but it is easy to see that his leaning is strongly towards the Calvinists, and he utterly reprobates the papists. I should further say that, after reading his work, I have gained a much greater respect for the body of divines than I had before. One is so frequently scandalised by the pettiness, acrimony, and fanaticism shown in theological disputes that an inclination to these failings may reasonably be suspected in men of large religious profession. But I can assure my readers that Middleton's biographies appear, to the best of my judgment, to refer in by the far greater part to exceedingly noble characters. There are certainly a few personages of very doubtful reputation, especially in the earlier part of the work, which covers the turbid period of the Reformation, such as Cranmer, saintly in his professions, unscrupulous in his dealings, zealous for nothing, bold in speculation, a coward, and a time-server in action, a placable enemy, and a lukewarm friend. Macaulay. Nevertheless, I am sure that Middleton's collection, on the whole, is eminently fair and trustworthy. The 196 subjects of Middleton's biographies may be classified as follow. 22 of them were martyrs, mostly by fire. The latest of these, Homo, a pastor in the Cavanese in the time of Louis XIV, was executed, 1683, under circumstances of such singular atrocity that although they have nothing to do with my subject, I cannot forbear quoting what Middleton says about them. Hommel was sentenced to the wheel, where every limb, member, and bone of his body was broken with the iron bar forty hours before the executioner was permitted to strike him upon the breast with a stroke which they call le coup de grace, the blow of mercy, the death stroke which put an end to all his miseries. Others of the 196 worthies, including many of the martyrs, were active leaders in the Reformation, as Wycliffe, Zwingluis, Luther, Ridley, Calvin. Beza. Others were most eminent administrators, as Archbishops Parker, Grindle, and Usher. A few were thoroughgoing Puritans, as Bishop Potter, Knox, Welsh, the two Erskines, and Dr. J. Edwards. A larger number were men of an extreme but more pleasing form of piety, as Bunyan, Baxter, Watts, and George Herbert. The rest, and the majority of the whole list, may be described as pious scholars. As a general rule, the men in Middleton's collection had a considerable intellectual capacity and natural eagerness for study, both of which qualities were commonly manifest in boyhood. Most of them wrote voluminously and were continually engaged in priest services. They had evidently a strong need of utterance. They were generally, but by no means universally, of religious parentage, judging by the last one hundred biographies of Middleton's collection, the earlier part of the work giving two imperfect notices of their ancestry to make it of use to analyse it. It would appear that, out of one hundred men, only forty-one had one or more eminently religious parents, nothing whatever being said of the parentage of the other fifty-nine. The forty-one cases are divided thus. In seventeen cases, a. the father was a minister. In sixteen cases, b. the father not being a minister, both parents were religious. In five cases, C, the mother only is mentioned as pious. In two cases, D, the mother's near relatives are known to have been religious. In one case, E, the father alone is mentioned as pious. There is no case in which either or both parents are distinctly described as having been sinful, though there are two cases, F, of meanness, and one, 
g of overspending the condition of life of the parents is mentioned in sixty-six cases more than one-third of the whole they fall into the following groups four highly connected hamilton george prince of anhalt john alasco herbert eight ancient families not necessarily wealthy joel deering gilpin hildersham ames Bedell, lewis de dieu palmer fifteen well connected oeclompadius swinglius capito farrell jones bergenhagers bullinger sandys featley dodd fulk pool baxter griffith jones davies twenty three professional melanchthon and top lady officers in army Gaetaker, usher and sorin legal seventeen were ministers see list already given devenant merchant six in trade two abbots weaver tweese clothier bunyan tinker watts boarding school doddridge oilman poor huss ball garnus Fagius, letimer six very poor luther pelican musculus cox andreas Prideau. there is therefore nothing anomalous in the parentage of the divines it is what we should expect to have found among secular scholars born within the same periods of our history the divines are not founders of influential families poverty was not always the reason of this because we read of many whose means were considerable w gouge left a fair fortune to t gouge wherewith he supported welsh and other charities evans had considerable wealth which he wholly lost by speculations in the south sea bubble and others are mentioned who were highly connected and therefore more or less well off the only families that produced men of importance are those of sorin whose descendant was the famous attorney-general of ireland of archbishop sandys whose descendant after several generations became the first lord sandys and of hooker who was an ancestor of the eminent botanists the late and present directors of the kew botanical gardens the divines as a whole have had hardly any appreciable influence in founding the governing families of england or in producing other judges statesmen commanders men of literature and science poets or artists the divines are but moderately prolific judging from the latter biographies about one half of them were married and there were about five or possibly six children to each marriage that is to say the number actually recorded gives at the rate of four point five but in addition to these occurs about once in six or seven cases the phrase many children the insertion of these occasional unknown but certainly large numbers would swell the average by a trifling amount again it is sometimes not clear whether the number of children who survived infancy may not be stated by mistake as the number of births and owing to this doubt we must further increase the estimated average now in order that population should not decrease each set of four adults two males and two females must leave at least four children who live to be adults behind them in the case of the divines we have seen that only one half are married men therefore each married divine must leave four adults to succeed him if his race is not to decrease this implies an average family of more than six children or as a matter of fact larger families than the divines appear to have had those who marry often marry more than once we hear in all of eighty-one married men three of these namely junius gattaker and flavel had each of them four wives Booser and Mather had three, and twelve others had two wives each. The frequency with which the divines became widowers is a remarkable fact, especially as they did not usually marry when young. I account for the early deaths of their wives, on the hypothesis that their constitutions were weak, and my reasons for thinking so are twofold. First, a large proportion of them died in childbirth, but seven such deaths are mentioned, and there is no reason to suppose that all, or nearly all, that occurred have been recorded by Middleton secondly it appears that the wives of the divines were usually women of great pity now it will be shown a little further on that there is a frequent correlation between an unusually devout disposition and a weak constitution the divines seem to have been very happy in their domestic life i know a few exceptions to this rule the wife of t cooper was unfaithful and that of poor hooker was a termagant 
Yet, in many cases, these simple-hearted worthies had made their proposals under advice, and not through love. Calvin married on Bucer's advice, and as for Bishop Hall, he may tell his own story, for it is a typical one. After he had built his house, he says in his autobiography, the uncouth solitariness of my life and the extreme incommodity of my single housekeeping drew my thoughts after two years to condescend to the necessity of a married estate, which God no less strangely provided for me. For walking from the church on Monday in the White Sun Week with a grave and reverend minister, Mr. Grandage, I saw a comely and modest gentlewoman standing at the door of that house, where we were invited to a wedding dinner, and inquiring of that worthy friend whether he knew her, yes quoth he i know her well and have bespoken her for your wife when i further demanded an account of that answer he told me she was a daughter of a gentleman whom he much respected mr george winniff of brendenham that out of an opinion had of the fitness of that match for me he had already treated with her father about it whom he found very apt to entertain it advising me not to neglect the opportunity and not concealing the just praises of the modesty pity good disposition and other virtues that were lodged in that seemly presence i listened to the motion as sent from god and at last drew upon prosecution happily prevailed enjoying the company of that meet help for the space of forty-nine years the mortality of the divines follows closely the same order in those who are mentioned in the earlier as in the latter volumes of middleton's collection although the conditions of life must have arrived in the periods to which they refer out of the one hundred ninety six nearly half of them die between the ages of fifty five and seventy five one quarter die before fifty five and one quarter after seventy five sixty two or sixty three is the average age at death in the sense that as many die before that age as after it this is rather less than i have deduced from the other groups of eminent men treated of in this volume dodd the most aged of all the divines lived till he was ninety eight nommel and dumoulin died between ninety and ninety-five sankius beza and conant between eighty-five and ninety the diseases that killed them are chiefly those due to a sedentary life for if we exclude the matires one quarter of all the recorded cases were from the stone or strangury between which diseases the doctors did not then satisfactorily discriminate indeed they murdered bishop wilkins by mistaking the one for the other there are five cases of plague and the rest consist of the following groups in pretty equal proportions viz fever and ague lung disease brain attacks and unclassed diseases as regards health the constitutions of most of the divines were remarkably bad it is i find very common among scholars to have been infirm in youth whence partially from inaptitude to join in with other boys in their amusements and partially from unhealthy inactivity of the brain they take eagerly to bookish pursuits speaking broadly there are three eventualities to these young students they die young or they strengthen as they grow retaining their tastes and enabled to indulge them with sustained energy or they live on in a sickly way the divines are largely recruited from the sickly portion of these adults there is an air of invalidism about most religious biographies that also seemed to me to pervade to some degree the lives in middleton's collection he especially notices the following fourteen or fifteen cases of weak constitution one melanchthon lower d sixty three whose health required continual management two calvin lower d fifty five faint thin and consumptive but who nevertheless got through an immense amount of work perhaps we may say three junius lower d forty seven a most infirm and sickly child never expected to reach manhood but he strengthened as he grew and though he died young it was a plague that killed him he moreover survived four wives four down lower d sixty one a somersetshire vicar who through all his life in health and strength was a professional pilgrim and sojourner in the world five george herbert lower d forty two consumptive and subject of frequent fevers and other infirmities seems to have owned the bent of his mind very much to his ill health for he grew more pious as he became more stricken and we can trace that courageous chivalric character in him which developed itself in a more robust way in his ancestors and brothers who were mostly gallant soldiers 
One brother was a sailor of reputation, another carried twenty-four wounds on his person. 6. Bishop Potter, lower D, 64, was of a weak constitution, melancholic, lean, and puritanical. 7. Janeway, lower D, 24, found hard study and work by far an overmatch for him. 8. Baxter, lower D, 76, was always in wretched health. He was tormented with a stone in the kidney, which, by the way, is said to have been preserved in the College of Surgeons. 9. Philip Henry, lower D, 65, called the Heavenly Henry when a young clergyman was a weakly child. He grew stronger as an adult, but ruined his improved health by the sedentary ways of a student's life, alternating with excitement in the pulpit, where he sweated profusely as he prayed fervently. He died of apoplexy. 10. Harvey, lower D, 30, was such a weakly, puny object that his father did not like his becoming a minister, lest his stature should render him despicable. 11. Moth, lower D, unknown age, seems another instance. Hardly any personal anecdote is given of him, except that God was pleased to try him many ways, which phrase I interpret to include ill health. 12. Brennard, lower D, 29. Was naturally infirm and died of a complication of obstinate disorders. 13. Hervey, lower D. 55. Though an early riser was very weakly by nature, he was terribly emaciated before his death. 14. Guise, lower D. 81. A great age for those times was nevertheless sickly. He was hectic and overworked in early life, afterwards ill and lame, and lastly blind. 15. Top lady, lower D, 38, struggled in vain for health and a longer life by changing his residence at the sacrifice of his hopes of fortune. In addition to these 15 cases of constitutions stated to have been naturally weak, we should count at least 12 of those that broke down under the strain of work. Even when the labour that ruined their health was unreasonably severe, the zeal which goaded them to work beyond their strength may be considered as being, in some degree, the symptom of a faulty constitution. Each case ought to be considered on its own merits. They are as follows. 1. Would take her. Lower D. 48. Laid the seeds of death by his incredible application. 2. Rollock. Lower D. 43. The first principal of the University of Edinburgh died in consequence of overwork, though an actual case of his death was the stone. 3. Dr. Reynolds. Lower D. 48. Called the treasury of all learning, human and divine deliberately followed his instinct for overwork to the very grave, saying that he would not prosper vitamin vivendi perdere causas, lose the ends of living for the sake of life. 4. Stock. Lower D. Unknown age. Spent himself like a taper, consuming himself for the good of others. 5. Preston. Lower D. 41 sacrificed his life to excessive zeal he is quoted as an example of the saying that men of great parts have no moderation he died an old man at the age of forty one six herbert palmer lower d forty six after a short illness for having spent much of his natural strength in the service of god there was less work for sickness to do seven bailey lower d fifty four who was so wholly and conscientious that if he had been at any time but innocently pleasant in the company of his friends, it cost him afterwards some sad reflections. Preserve me for the privilege of such companions. Lost his health early in life. 8. Clark, lower D. 62. Was too laborious, and had in consequence a fever, at 43, which extremely weakened his constitution. 9. Ulrich, lower D. 48. Had an ill habit of body contracted by a sedentary life and an overstraining of his voice in preaching. 10. Isaac Watts, lower D. 74. A proficient child, but not strong, fell very ill at 24, and again at 38, and from this he never recovered, but passed the rest of his life in congenial seclusion, an inmate of the house of Sir T. Abney, and afterwards of his widow. 11. Davies, lower D, 37, a sprightly boy and keen rider, 
grew into a religious man of so sedentary a disposition that after he was made president of yale college in america he took hardly any exercise he was there killed by a simple cold followed by some imprudence in sermon writing his vital powers being too low to support any physical strain twelve t jones lower d thirty two before the lord was pleased to call him he was walking in the error of his ways then he was afflicted with a disorder that kept him very low and brought him to death's door during all which time his growth in grace was great and remarkable this concludes my list of those divines twenty six in number who were specially noted by middleton as invalids it will be seen that about one half of them were infirm from the first and that the other half became broken down early in life it must not be supposed that the remainder of the 196 were invariably healthy men. His biographies dwell little on personal characteristics, and therefore their silence on the matter of health must not be interpreted as necessarily meaning that the health was good. On the contrary, as I said before, there is an air of the sick room running through the collection, but to a mere less degree than the religious biographies that I have elsewhere read a gently complaining and fatigued spirit is that which evangelical divines are very apt to pass their days it is curious how large a part of religious biographies is commonly given up to the occurrences of the sick room we can easily understand why considerable space should be devoted to such matters because it is on the deathbed that the beliefs are surely tested but this is insufficient to account for all we find in Milton and elsewhere. There is, I think, an actual pleasure shown by evangelical writers in dwelling on occurrences that disgust most people. Rivet, a French divine, has strangulation of the intestines which kills him after twelve days' suffering. The remedies attempted, each successive pang and each corresponding religious ejaculation is recorded, and so the history of his bowel attack is protracted through forty-five pages, which is as much space as is allotted to the entire biographies of four average divines. Mead's death and its cause is described with equal minuteness and with still more repulsive details, but in a less diffuse form. I have thus far shown that twenty-six divines out of the one hundred ninety-six, or one-eighth part of them, were certainly invalids, and I have laid much stress on the hypothesis that silence about health does not mean healthiness. However, I can add other reasons to corroborate my very strong impression that the divines are, on the whole, an ailing body of men. I can show that the number of persons mentioned as robust are disproportionately few, and I would claim a comparison between the numbers of the notably weak and the notably strong, rather than one between the notably weak and the rest of the 196. In professions where men are obliged to speak much in public, the constitutional vigour of those who succeed is commonly extraordinary. It would be impossible to read a collection of lives of eminent orators, lawyers, and the like, without being impressed with the largeness of the number of those who have constitutions of iron. But this is not at all the case with the divines, for Middleton speaks of only twelve, or perhaps thirteen men, who were remarkable for their vigour. Two very instructive facts appear in connection with these vigorous divines. We find, on the one hand, that of the twelve or thirteen who were decidedly robust five if not six were irregular and wild in their youth and on the other hand that only three or four divines are stated to have been irregular in their youth who were not also men of notably robust constitutions we are therefore compelled to conclude that robustness of constitution is antagonistic in a very marked degree to an extremely pious disposition first as to those who have been vigorous in constitution and wild in youth they are five or six in number. One, Beza, lower D, 86, was a robust man of very strong constitution, and what is very unusual among hard students, never felt the headache. He yielded as a youth to the allurements of pleasure, and wrote poems of a very licentious character. Two, Welch, lower D, 53, was of strong robust constitution and underwent a great deal of fatigue. In youth he was a border thief. 3. Rothwell, lower D, 64, was handsome, well set, of great strength of body and activity. He hunted, bowled, and shot. He also poached a little. Though he was a clergyman, he did not reform till late, and still the devil assaulted him, much and long. He got on particularly well with his parishioners in a wild part of the north of England. 4. Grimshaw, lower D, 
55 was only once sick for the space of 16 years though he used his body with less consideration than a merciful man would use his beast he was educated religiously but broke loose at 18 at cambridge at the age of 26 being then a swearing drunken parson he was partially converted and at 34 his preaching began to be profitable then it followed 21 years of eminent usefulness 5 whitefield lower d 56 had extraordinary activity constantly preaching and constantly travelling he had great constitutional powers though from disease he grew corpulent after forty he was extremely irregular in early youth drinking and pilfering stephen ecclesial biographies six it is probable that tros ought to be added to this list he will again be spoken of in the next category but one next as to those who were vigorous in constitution but not irregular in youth they are seven in number one peter mater lower d sixty two a large healthy man of grave sedate and well composed countenance his parts and learning were very uncommon two mead lower d fifty two was a fine handsome dignified man middleton remarks that his vitals were strong and he did not mind the cold and that he had a sound mind in a sound body he was a sceptic when a student at college but not wild three bedell lower d seventy two a tall graceful dignified man a favourite even with italian papists suffered no decay of his natural powers till near his death four leighton lower d seventy of a sudden attack of pleurisy he looked so fresh up to that time that age seemed to stand still with him five burkett lower d fifty three of a malignant fever but his strength was such that he might have been expected to live till eighty he was turned to religion when a boy by an attack of smallpox six alex lower d seventy six had an uncommon share of health and spirits he was a singularly amiable capable and popular man seven harrison d unknown age a strong robust man full of flesh and blood humble devout and of bright natural parts this concludes a list i have been surprised to find none of the type of cromwell's ironsides lastly as to those who are irregular in youth but who are not mentioned as being vigorous in constitution they are three or four in number, according to Trous, is omitted or included. 1. William Perkins, lower d. 43. A cheerful, pleasant man. Was wild and a spendthrift at Cambridge, and not converted till 24. 2. Bunyan, vicious in youth, was converted in a wild, irregular way, and had many backslidings throughout his career. 3. Trous, lower d. 82. His biography is deficient in particulars about which one would like to be informed, but his long life followed a bad beginning, appears to be a sign of an unusually strong constitution, and to qualify him for insertion in my first category. He was sent to France to learn the language, and he learned also every kind of French rascality. The same process was repeated in Portugal. The steps by which his character became remarkably changed are not recorded neither are his personal characteristics four t jones lower d thirty two has already been included among the invalids having been wild in youth but rendered pious by serious and lingering ill health i now come to the relationships of the divines recollecting that there are only one hundred ninety six of them altogether that they are selected from the whole of protestant europe at the average rate of twenty two men in three years the following results are quite as remarkable as those met with in the other groups. 17 out of the 196 are interrelated. Thus Simon Gyrinos is uncle of Thomas, who is father of John James, and there are others of note in this remarkable family of peasant origin. White Tager's maternal uncle was Dr. Noel. Robert Abbott, Bishop of Salisbury, is brother to Archbishop Abbott. Down's maternal uncle was Bishop Jewell. Dodd's grandson, daughter's son, was Bishop Wilkins. William Gouge was father of Thomas Gouge. Philip Henry was father to Matthew Henry. Ebenezer Erskine was brother to Ralph Erskine. 
There are eight others who have remarkable relationships, mostly with religious people, namely Knox's grandson, the son of a daughter who married John Welch, and Josiah Welch, the cock of the conscience. F. Junius had a son, also called Francis, a learned Oxonian, by his daughter who married J. G. Vossius. He had for grandchildren Dionysius and Isaac Vossius, famous for their learning. John was descended through his mother from Lord Chancellor Sir John Moore and Judge Restall. Herbert was brother to Lord Herbert of Cherbury, and had other eminent and interesting relationships. Usher's connections are most remarkable for his father, father's brother, mother's father, mother's brother and his own brother were all very eminent men in their day the mother's brother of louis de dieu was a professor of leyden the father and grandfather of mather were eminent ministers the father and three brothers of sorin were remarkably eloquent it cannot be doubted from these facts that religious gifts are on the whole hereditary but there are curious exceptions to the rule Milton's work must not be considered as free from omissions of these exceptional cases. Neither he nor any other biographer would conceive it to be his duty to write about a class of facts which are important for us to obtain, namely, the cases in which the sons of religious parents turned out badly. I have only lighted on a single instance of this apparent perversion of the laws of hereditary in the whole of Milton's work, namely that of Archbishop Matthew but it is often said that such cases are not uncommon i rely mostly for my belief in their existence upon social experiences of modern date which could not be published without giving pain to innocent individuals those of which i know with certainty are not numerous but are sufficient to convince me of there being a real foundation for the popular notion the notoriety of some recent cases will i trust satisfy the reader and absolve me from entering any further into details the summary of the results concerning the divines to which i have thus far arrived is that they are not founders of families who have exercised a notable influence on our history whether that influence be derived from the abilities wealth or social position of any of their members that they are a moderately prolific race rather under than above the average that their average age at death is a trifle less than that of the eminent men comprised in my other groups that they commonly suffer from overwork that they have usually wretched constitutions that those whose constitutions were vigorous were mostly wild in their youth and conversely that most of those who had been wild in their youth and did not become pious till later in life were men of vigorous constitutions that a pious disposition is decidedly hereditary that there are also frequent cases of sons of pious parents who turned out very badly but i shall have something to say on what appears to me to be the reason for this I therefore see no reason to believe that the divines are an exceptionally favoured race in any respect, but rather that they are less fortunate than other men. I now annex my usual tables. Table 1 is displayed on the page. Summary of relationships of 33 of the divines of Middleton's Biographica Evangelica grouped into 25 families. Table 2 is also displayed with degrees of kinship. A comparison of the relative influences of the male and female lines of descent is made in the following table. In the second degree, 1 upper G plus 3 upper U plus 0 upper N plus 0 upper P equals 4, kinships through males. 4 lower G plus 7 lower U plus 1 lower N plus 4 lower P equals 16, kinships through females. In the third degree, 0 upper G upper F plus 0 upper G upper B plus 2 upper U upper S plus 0 up n up s plus 0 upper p upper s kinships through males 1 lower g upper f plus 1 lower g upper b plus 0 lower u upper s plus 0 lower n upper s plus 0 lower p upper s equals 2 kinships through females this table shows that the influence of the female line has an unusually large effect in qualifying a man to become eminent in the religious world the only other group in which the influence of the female line is even comparable in its magnitude is that of scientific men, and I believe the reasons laid down when speaking of them will apply, mutatis mutandis, to the divines. It requires unusual qualifications, and some of them of a feminine caste, to become a leading theologian. A man must not only have appropriate abilities and zeal and power of work, 
but the postulates of the creed that he professes must be so firmly ingrained into his mind as to be the equivalents of axioms the diversities of creeds held by earnest good and conscientious men show to a candid looker-on that there can be no certainty as to any point on which many of such men think differently but a divine must not accept this view he must be convinced of the absolute security of the groundwork of his peculiar faith a blind conviction which can best be obtained through maternal teachings in the years of childhood i will now endeavour to account for the fact which i am compelled to acknowledge that the children of very religious parents occasionally turn out extremely badly it is a fact that has all the appearance of being a serious violation of the law of hereditary and as such has caused me more hesitation and difficulty than i have felt about any other part of my inquiry however i am perfectly satisfied that this apparent anomaly is entirely explained by what i am about to lay before the reader premising that it obliges me to enter into a more free and thorough analysis of the religious character than would otherwise have been suitable to these pages the disposition that qualifies a man to attain a place in a collection like that of the biographica evangelica can best be studied by comparing it with one that while it contrasts with it in essentials closely resembles it in all the unimportant respects thus we may exclude from our comparison all except those whose average moral dispositions are elevated some grades above those of men generally and we may also exclude all except such as think very earnestly reverently and conscientiously upon religious matters the remainder range in their views and for the most part in the natural disposition that inclines them to adopt those views from the extremest piety to the extremest scepticism the biographica evangelica affords many instances that approach to the former ideal and we may easily select from history men who have approached to the latter in order to contrast and so understand the nature of the differences between the two ideal extremes we must lay aside for a while our own religious predilections whatever they may be and place ourselves resolutely on a point equidistant from both whence we can survey them alternately and with equal eye let us then begin clearly understanding that we are supposing both the sceptic and the religious man may be equally earnest virtuous temperate and affectionate both perfectly convinced of the truth of their respective tenets and both finding moral content in such conclusions as those tenets imply the religious man affirms that he is conscious of an indwelling spirit of grace that consoles guides and dictates and that he could not stand if it were taken away from him it renders easy the trials of his life and calms the dread that would otherwise be occasioned by the prospect of death it gives directions and inspires motives and it speaks through the voice of the conscience as an oracle upon what is right and what is wrong he will add that the presence of this spirit of grace is a matter that no argument or theory is capable of explaining away inasmuch as the conviction of its presence is fundamental in its nature and the signs of its action are as unmistakable as those of any other actions made known to us through the medium of the senses the religious man would further dwell on the moral doctrine of the form of creed that he professes but this we must eliminate from the discussion because the moral doctrines of the different forms of creed are exceedingly diverse some tending to self-culture and asceticism and others to active benevolence but we are seeking to find the nature of a religious disposition so far as it is common to all creeds the sceptic takes a position antagonistic to that which i have described as appertaining to the religious man he acknowledges the sense of an indwelling spirit which possibly he may assert to have himself experienced in its full intensity but he denies its objectivity he argues that as it is everywhere acknowledged to be a fit question for the intellect to decide whether other convictions however fundamental are really true or whether the evidences of the senses are in every given case to be depended upon so it is perfectly legitimate to submit religious convictions to a similar analysis he will say that a floating speck in the vision and a ringing in the ears are capable of being discriminated by the intellect from the effects of external influences that in lands where mirage is common the experienced traveller has to decide on the truth of the appearance of water by the circumstances of each particular case 
and as to fundamental convictions he will add that it is well known the intellect can successfully grapple with them for kant and his followers have shown reasons to which all metaphysicians ascribe weight that time and space are neither of them objective realities but only forms which under our minds by virtue of our own constitution are compelled to act the sceptic therefore claiming to bring the question of the objective existence of the spirit of grace under intellectual examination has decided whether rightly or not has nothing to do with our inquiries that it is subjective not objective he argues that it is not self-consistent in its action inasmuch as it prompts different people in different ways and the same person in different ways at different times that there is no sharp demarcation between the promptings that are validly natural and those that are considered supernatural lastly that convictions of right and wrong are misleading inasmuch as a person who indulges in them without check from the reason becomes a blind partisan and partisans on hostile sides fill them in equal strength as to the sense of consolation derived from the creature of a fond imagination he will point to the experiences of the nursery where the girl tells all its griefs to its doll converses with it takes counsel with it and consoles by it putting unconsciously her own words into the mouth of the doll for these and similar reasons which it is only necessary for me to state and not to weigh the thorough-going ideal sceptic deliberately crushes those very sentiments and convictions which the religious man prizes above all things he pronounces them to be idols created by the imagination and therefore to be equally abhorred with idols made by the hands of grosser material thus far we have only pointed out an intellectual difference a matter of no direct service in itself in solving the question on which we are engaged but of the utmost importance when the sceptic and religious man are supposed to rest contentedly in their separate conclusions in order that a man may be contented sceptic of the most extreme type he must have confidence in himself that he is qualified to stand absolutely alone in the presence of the severest trials of life and of the terrors of impending death his nature must have sufficient self-assertion and stoicism to make him believe that he can act the whole of his part upon earth without assistance this is the ideal form of the most extreme scepticism to which some few may nearly approach but it is questionable if any have ever reached on the other hand the support of a stronger arm and of a consoling voice are absolute necessities to a man who has a religious disposition he is conscious of an incongruity in his nature and of an instability in his disposition and he knows his insufficiency to help himself but all humanity is more or less subject to these feelings especially in sickness in youth and in old age and women are more affected by them than men the most vigorous are conscious of secret weaknesses and failings which give them often in direct proportion to their intellectual stoicism agonies of self-distrust but in the extreme and ideal form which we are supposing the incongruity and instability would be extreme he would not be fit to be a free man for he could not exist without a confessor and a master here then is a broad distinction between the natural dispositions of the two classes of men the man of religious constitution considers the contented sceptic to be foolhardy and sure to fail miserably the sceptic considers the man of an extremely pious disposition to be slavish and inclined to superstition it is sometimes said that a conviction of sin is a characteristic of a religious disposition i think however the strong sense of sinfulness in a christian to be partially due to the doctrines of his intellectual creed the sceptic equally with the religious man would feel disgust and shame at his miserable weakness in having done yesterday in the heat of some impulse things which to-day in his calm moments he disapproves he is sensible that if another person had done the same thing he would have shunned him so he similarly shuns the contemplation of his own self he feels he has done that which makes him unworthy of the society of pure-minded men that he is a distinguished pariah who would deserve to be driven out with indignation if his recent acts and real character were suddenly disclosed the christian feels all this and something more he feels he has committed his faults in the full sight of a pure god that he acts ungratefully and cruelly to a being full of love and compassion who died as a sacrifice for sins like those he has just committed the considerations at extreme poignancy 
to the sense of sin but it must be recollected that they depend upon no difference of character if the sceptic held the same intellectual creed he would feel them in precisely the same way as a religious man it is not necessarily dullness of heart that keeps him back it is also sometimes believed that puritanic ways are associated with strong religious professions but a puritan tendency is by no means an essential part of a religious disposition the puritan's character is joyless and morose he is most happy or to speak less paradoxically most at peace with himself when sad it is a mental condition correlated with the well-known puritan features black straight hair hallowed cheeks and sallow complexion a bright blue-eyed rosy-cheeked curly-heeled youth would seem an anomaly in a puritanical assembly but there are many divines mentioned in middleton whose character was most sunny and joyful and whose society was dearly prized showing distinctly the puritan type is a speciality and by no means an inviolable ingredient in the constitution of men who are naturally inclined to pity the result of all these considerations is to show that the chief peculiarity in the moral nature of the pious man is his conscious instability he is liable to extremes now swinging forwards into regions of enthusiasm adoration and self-sacrifice now backwards into the sensuality and selfishness very devout people are apt to style themselves the most miserable of sinners and i think they may be taken to a considerable extent at their word it would appear that their dispositions is to sin more frequently and to repeat more fervently than those whose constitutions are stoical and therefore of a more symmetrical and orderly character the amplitude of the moral oscillations of religious men is greater than that of others whose average moral position is the same the table page thirty four of the distribution of natural gifts is necessarily as true of morals as of intellect or of muscle if we class a vast number of men into fourteen classes separated by equal grades of morality as regards our natural disposition the number of men per million in the different classes will be as stated in the table i have no doubt that many of middleton's divines belong to class g in respect to their active benevolence unselfishness and other amiable qualities but men of the lowest grades of morals may also have pious amplitudes thus among prisoners the best attendants on religious worship are often the worst criminals i do not however think it is always an act of conscious hypocrisy in bad men when they make pious professions but rather that they are deeply conscious of the instability of their characters and that they fly to devotion as a resource and consolation these views will i think explain the apparent anomaly why the children of extremely pious parents occasionally turn out very badly the parents are naturally gifted with high moral characters combined with instability of disposition but these peculiarities are in no way correlated it must therefore often happen that the child will inherit the one not the other if this heritage consists of the moral gifts without great instability he will not feel the need of extreme pity if he inherits great instability without morality he will be very likely to disgrace his name End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 16 Senior Classics of Cambridge. The position of Senior Classic at Cambridge is of the same rank in regard to classical achievement as that of the Senior Wrangler is to achievement in mathematics. Therefore, all that I said about the severity of the selection implied by the latter degree, see page 16 to 21, is strictly applicable to the former. I have chosen the senior classics for the subject of this chapter rather than the senior wranglers for the reasons explained in page 197. The classical tripos was established in the year 1824. There have therefore been 46 lists between that time and the year 1869 both inclusive in nine cases out of these two or more names were bracketed together at the head of the list as equal in merit leaving thirty-six cases of men who were distinctly the first classics of their several years their names are as follow malkin isaacson stratton kennedy selwyn soames 
Wordsworth, Kennedy, Lushington, Bunbury, Kennedy, Goulburn, Osborne, Humphrey, Freeman, Cope, Denman, Maine, Lushington, Elwin, Perrone, Lightfoot, Roby, Hawkins, Butler, Brown, Clark, Sidgwick, Abbott, Jeb, Wilson, Moss, Whitelaw, Smith, Sandys, Kennedy. It will be observed that the name of Kennedy occurs no less than four times, and that of Lushington twice in this short series. I will give the genealogies of these, and of a few others of which I have particulars, and which I have italicized in the above list, begging it at the same time to be understood that I do not mean to say that many of the remainder may not also be distinguished for the eminence of their kinsmen. I have not cared to make extensive and minute inquiries, because the following list is amply sufficient for my purpose. It is obvious that the descending relationships must be generally deficient, since the oldest of all the senior classics took his degree in 1834, and would therefore be only about 57 at the present time. For the most part, the sons have yet to be proved, and the grandsons to be born. There is no case in my list of only a single eminent relationship. There are four, namely Denman, Goulburn, Selwyn, and Sidgwick, of only two or three. All the others have four or upwards. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Hereditary Genius by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter Seventeen Oarsman. I propose to supplement what I have written about brain by two short chapters on muscle. No one doubts that muscle is hereditary in horses and dogs. But humankind are so blind to facts and so governed by preconceptions that I have heard it frequently asserted that muscle is not hereditary in men. Oarsmen and wrestlers have maintained that their heroes spring up capriciously, so I have thought it advisable to make inquiries into the matter. The results I have obtained will beat down another place of refuge for those who insist that each man is an independent creation and not a mere function, physically, morally, and intellectually, of ancestral qualities and external influences. In respect to oarsmen, let me assure the reader that they are no insignificant fraction of the community, no mere waifs and strays from those who follow more civilized pursuits. A perfect passion for rowing pervades large classes. At Newcastle, when a great race takes place, all business is at a standstill, factories are closed, shops are shut, and offices deserted. The number of men who fall within the attraction of the career is very great, and there can be no doubt that a large proportion of those among them who are qualified to succeed brilliantly obey the attraction and pursue it. For information in this and the following chapters, I am entirely indebted to the kind inquiries made for me by Mr. Robert Spence Watson of Newcastle, whose local knowledge is very considerable and whose sympathies with athletic amusements are strong. Mr. Watson put himself into continual communication with one of the highest, I believe by far the highest, authority on boating matters. A person who had reported nearly every boating race to the newspapers for the last quarter of a century. The list in the appendix to this chapter includes the names of nearly all the rowing men of note who have figured upon the Tyne during the past six and twenty years. It also includes some of the rowers on the Thames, but the information about these is not so certain. The names are not picked and chosen, but the best men have been taken of whom any certain knowledge could be obtained. It is not easy to classify the rowers, especially as many of the men have rarely, if ever, pulled in skiff matches, but formed part of crews in pair-oared, four-oared, or six-oared matches. Their performances have, however, been carefully examined and criticised by Mr. Watson and his assessor, who have divided them into four classes. I have marked the names of the lowest with brackets, and have attached to them the phrase moderately good. These are men who have either disappointed expectations founded on early promise, or have not rowed often enough to show of what feats they are really capable. No complete failure is included. Few amateurs can cope with men of this class, notwithstanding the mediocrity of their abilities when judged by a professional standard. The next ascending grade is also distinguished by brackets, but no qualifying expression is added to their names. 
they consist of the steady reliable men who form good racing crews the two superior grades contain the men whose names are printed without brackets whom in short i treat as being eminently gifted in order to make a distinction between the two grades i add to the list of the men who belong to the higher of them the phrase very excellent oarsmen it is not possible to do more than give a rough notion of the places into which these four grades would respectively fall in my table page thirty four of natural gifts i have only two data to help me the first is that i am informed that in the early part of eighteen sixty eight the tyne amateur rowing club which is the most important institution of that kind in the north of england had been fifteen years in excellence and had comprised in all three hundred and seventy seven members that three of these as judged by amateur standards of comparison had been considered of surpassing excellence as skiff rowers and that the best of these three was looked upon as equal to or perhaps a trifle better than the least good of the brothers matfin who barely ranks as an excellent rower the other datum in the deliberate opinion of the authorities to whom i am indebted for the materials of this chapter that not one man in ten will succeed as a rower even of the lower of the two grades whose names are marked in my appendix by brackets and that not one in one hundred rowers attains to excellence hence the minimum qualification for excellence is possessed by only one man in one thousand there is a rough accordance between these two data a rowing club consists in part of naturally selected men they are not men all of whom have been taken at haphazard as regards their powers of rowing a large part are undoubtedly mere conscripts from the race of clubable men but there must always be a considerable number who would not have joined the club save for their conscientiousness of possessing gifts and tastes that specially qualified them for success on the water to be the best oarsman of three hundred and seventy seven men who are comprised in a crack rowing club means much more than to be the best of three hundred and seventy seven men taken at haphazard it would be much nearer the truth to say that in means being the best of all who might have joined the club had they been so inclined and had appeared desirable members upon these grounds see also my remarks on page twelve it is a very moderate estimate to conclude that the qualifications for excellence as an oarsman are only possessed by one man in one thousand the very excellent oarsmen imply i presume a much more rigorous selection but i really have no data whatever on which to found an estimate many men who found they could attain no higher rank than excellence would abandon the unprofitable pursuit of match rowing for more regular and as some would say creditable occupations we shall not be more than half a grade wrong if we consider the excellent oarsmen to rank in at least class f of natural gifts with respect to rowing ability and the very excellent to fall well within it i do not propose to take any pains in analysing these relationships for the data are inadequate rowing was comparatively little practised in previous generations so we cannot expect to meet with evidence of ancestral peculiarities among the oarsmen again the successful rowers are mostly single men and some of the best have no children it is important in respect to this to recollect the frequent trainings they have gone through mr watson mentions to me one well-known man who was trained for an enormous number of races and during the time of each training was more absentious and in an amazing health then after each trial was over he commonly gave way and without committing any great excess remained for weeks in a state of fuddle this is too often the history of these men there are in the appendix only three families each containing more than one excellent oarsman they are clasper matfin and taylor and the total relationships existing towards the ablest member of each family are eight upper b and one upper s there appears to be no intermarriage except in the one case that is mentioned between the families of the rowers indeed there is much jealousy between the rival families End of chapter 17。chapter 18 of hereditary genius by Francis Galton。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit librivox.org。recorded by Leon Harvey。chapter 18。wrestlers of the north country。I am wholly indebted for the information contained in this chapter, as I was for that in the last to Mr. Robert Spence Watson, with the assistance of a well-informed champion wrestler, 
that gentleman has examined into the history of those of the 172 men of whom anything could be learned who were either first or second at carlisle or newcastle since the establishment of the championship at those places at the first in 1809 and at the second in 1839 it is exceedingly difficult to estimate the performances of the ancestors of the present generation because there were scarcely any prizes in former days matches there then made simply for honour we must not expect to be able to trace ancestral gifts among the wrestlers to a greater degree than among the oarsmen i should add that i made several attempts to obtain information on wrestling families in lake districts of westmoreland and cumberland but entirely without success no records seem to have been kept of the yearly meetings at Kenswick and Bowness, and the wrestling deeds of past years have fallen out of mind. There are eighteen families in my appendix, containing between them forty-six wrestlers, and the relationships existing towards the ablest wrestler of the family are one upper F, twenty-one upper B, seven upper S, and one lower N. End of chapter 18